Hello to everyone out there and welcome to our virtual on the couch session with Grant Stevens, the Commissioner of SAPOL. I'm Imelda Alexopoulos and I'm a partner at PwC. Today I have the privilege of being able to ask Grant some questions and to specifically get his insights into the essential role the South Australian Police have played in the management of the COVID-19 crisis situation. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that the land we meet on today are the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. I'd also like to quickly acknowledge the IPA team and their major partners, PwC, Flinders University, the Office of the Commissioner for Public Sector Employment, South Australian Leadership Academy, and the government senior management team for being able to create this opportunity. So thank you. Okay, Grant, I'd like to start off with talking specifically about your role as the state coordinator. So under the Emergency Management Act, you have essentially been put in charge of the response to COVID-19 for the state. I think we'd all agree that it's been pretty successful so far in terms of keeping cases to a minimum and really community transmission is not an issue. What were your key focus areas when you set about tackling the task? And I have a second part to my question. What has been the biggest challenge in respect to having to undertake that role? Well, that's a really good question. Um, key focus areas, I suppose, come down to the advice that we're provided by health in South Australia. The Chief Public Health Officer is the principal source of advice that uh, I rely upon uh, to give effect to what the health requirements are to protect the community of South Australia. Um, it is technically true that the buck stops with me under a major emergency and as the State Coordinator I have that authority but I'm not acting in isolation. Um, uh, it's, it is, has genuinely been a team effort with um, collaborating with health, other emergency services, uh, other key agencies within South Australia, and importantly, the community of South Australia. The performance we've seen in South Australia in relation to um, preventing the spread of the coronavirus and um, the compliance that we've seen with the restrictions that have been put in place, I think is a testament to the, the community we have here in in the broader state, um, and that's where a lot of the credit should go. We've put a lot of restrictions on the community, and this is something I'm really mindful of, and it's probably probably the biggest challenge, is communicating to the community the necessity for these restrictions and what we're trying to achieve. Overwhelmingly, we've seen people doing the right thing, and I'm immensely proud of that because that I think that shows the true character of our community, which is one that is prepared to make some sacrifices to help vulnerable members of the community. So our Premier Stephen Marshall commented last week in his own IPA interview that you displayed calm and diligent leadership in relation to administering directions to the public during the COVID-19 crisis. In addition to this and thinking about you know, your own approach, what do you think are the key leadership qualities and uh, behaviours that leaders really need to be displaying in times of crisis? Um, I've thought about this quite a bit um, because there has been significant pressure and we are, we, I am mindful of the, uh, the implications of the decisions we're making. So I think from my point of view, it is about being seen to be calm but also decisive and I think communication is absolutely essential. Being able to communicate clearly um, I think is the only way we really bring people along with us. Um, there's no room for panic in a situation like this where the level of the emergency is so substantial and having such a broad impact on our community. People need to see, I think, calm and authoritative leadership. So I'm hopeful that that is my genuine style and that um, it's it's what has served me well so far during the, the last couple of months when we've been under such immense pressure. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I really want to extend my condolences to you and the wider SAPOL team in relation to a recent loss um, and that being of um, Detective Chief Superintendent Joanne Shanahan. And I understand you know, that has 
had a significant impact to you and your team and obviously the wider community and those that knew Joanne. Having experienced that loss firsthand um, and, you know, we've seen the footage of having to not really be able to, I guess, pay your respects in the usual way that you would probably like to given the restrictions, has that given you a different perspective on the impact the restrictions are having on the broader community? I wouldn't say it's given me a different perspective because from the outset uh, when we decided on these restrictions that we were going to put in, in in place on the community, I was thinking about what it meant for individuals and businesses. Um, so I didn't go in with any sort of uh, misconception about the significance of what we were doing. Uh, Joanne's death and the the way we managed uh, her funeral service, I think, um, made it more personal. But at the same time, I've got uh, adult children who uh, have lost their jobs. I've got family friends, close family friends who no longer have employment uh, as a result of these restrictions and the way businesses have had, handle, have, had, had, had to handle that. Um, so I've, I've already felt that personal impact, but it's not a surprise to me. And I expected the sort of difficulties that would be associated with um, restricting weddings to five people, um, funerals to 10, um, young people losing their jobs because they're in casual employment and it's had an impact on so many people and so many people close to me. So Joanne was also known for her contribution to um, being in charge of the family and domestic violence branch. Given the current restrictions requiring isolation, um, you know, people having lost their jobs, perhaps they're working from home, um, even homeschooling, which felt like forever for me, <laughs> um, but was actually not that long in comparison to other states. Has SAPOL actually seen a increase or, you know, has there been an impact on the numbers of incidents uh, or crime in general? Well, it's one thing we're watching really closely. Uh, overall, crime is down. Um, it's down to levels that we have not seen for decades, which is, I suppose, a silver lining. And we're also watching very closely the incidence of domestic violence because we understand that with people spending more time with their families, not all families operate um, on a harmonious way. So we anticipate that there might be some potential for an increase in domestic violence. We have seen a slight increase, but it wouldn't be outside of what you'd call a normal fluctuation. So we're still continuing to watch that to see if this is a growth area or whether it's just a normal um, change in the statistics. We're working really closely with our partners in the domestic violence sector as well, um, making sure that people who need those services are able to access them and are reaching out for them if, if their circumstances change. We're visiting high-risk families, making sure that people are safe, um, but we will continue to watch it. The observation I've made is because we took a more, more moderate approach in South Australia with the restrictions, we haven't had people physically locked down with their families most of the day. People have been able to go out, they've been able to access support services or call police or visit police stations if they needed to. Um, so what we've seen interstate and internationally is probably not exactly the same comparison as to the circumstances in South Australia. Okay, and that would be due to, you think, in terms of the ability to be able to yeah. go and access those services, yeah? Uh, one of the observations was that um, people who are vulnerable... Um, potentially victims of domestic violence would, would not be able to get out. They wouldn't be able to make phone calls to support services or to call for help because they were in close proximity to the perpetrator. In South Australia, um, you, you've seen people in shopping centres, uh, along the beach fronts, um, going for walks in the park, um, going to work. So we haven't had the same level of restriction, which means there are opportunities for people to, to get out and get help if they need it. So what you've just described is really, it sounds like SA is leading the way in terms of, uh, you know, abiding by the um, restrictions as well as uh, social distancing rules, etc. What other factors do you think contribute to the success? Well, I think we took a more moderate approach from the outset. So we didn't lock people down to gatherings of no more than two people. We didn't enforce people... Uh, to stay home unless they were leaving for medical or essential work or uh, essential items or for an emergency. Um, and as I mentioned, I think the community have really embraced the, the principles about social distancing and doing the right thing. 
But from a law enforcement point of view, from a police point of view, uh, from the outset, our foundation was to work with the community, not to push this onto the community. Um, we, we did do a lot of checking. We checked people for their quarantine obligations. We checked businesses to make sure they weren't opening if they should, should not be. And um, in the first instance, we've tried to educate people, work with them, support them, give them the advice they need. And overwhelmingly, we've seen that that's resulted in high levels of um, compliance. So I think it's what the community have done. It's the moderate approach we took to start with. And it's also how we as a police service have worked with the community rather than just enforce this principle upon them. What we saw in other jurisdictions, I'm, I'm so pleased that uh, we haven't found ourselves in that situation where police officers are being criticised for uh, issuing expiation notices to people who are sitting on park benches or out on a paddleboard by themselves in the ocean. I just, I think we're in a much better spot. And how, do you think the other, um, the counterparts in other states, your counterparts, I should say, do you think that they have taken any learnings from what's been done in South Australia? I think they have watched us with envy. Um, and I've seen a relaxation of their um, policing approach in some jurisdictions, but it's a little bit too little too late, I think. Um, you, when you take a heavy handed approach, it's hard to step back from that. And it does damage to the reputation of a police service within its community. And we we strive to maintain a high level of regard uh, within the community. We want to be respected and we want to be trusted. And in order to be that type of police service, you have to work with the community. So I'm, I'm really pleased with how we got that right so far. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously unprecedented times. Has SAPOL had to innovate or do things differently in order to continue to serve the community? Given Absolutely, the yeah. Yeah, we've, um, we've re we have a... Um, a business continuity executive management team that's looking at uh, all of the functions that we undertake, what we compare back, uh, how we can divert resources from traditional policing functions into COVID-19 policing functions, but also maintain that level of public safety. The principle for us is a safe community, so there are some things we just can't stop doing. Um, we've cancelled leave, so there are no police officers on leave at the moment unless there are exceptional circumstances, which gives us a capacity to push additional police into border control activities, uh, compliance activities, generally supporting the community, but also targeting those high risk areas that we forecast may increase because of people closing their businesses or being at home, such as domestic violence or break-ins on business premises. So uh, we have adapted. We've also pushed in the order of about 800 people to work from home. Um, we've been talking about working from home and flexible work for a long time, and it took a, a pandemic for us to really innovate, access technology, and think about those positions and functions that could actually work remotely. So we've taken this as a giant step, and we'll now need to assess to see how much of that we can retain when we get back to what is more of a business as usual model. How, how, how have you found that going so far? Uh, people have embraced the work from home component. Um, Technology was critical. People need access to our systems. So our IT team did some amazing work in the first few weeks of this um, pandemic, created the capacity to people to access our systems. And then we looked at all of the positions we could push out, uh, particularly those people in the vulnerable age groups, um, given them opportunities to work from home, realign their functions so that they had meaningful work to do. And so far, so good. But we do need to assess it and look at how we might retain some of that when we come back to what uh, normal normal business looks like. So nationally, uh, you know, we've last week we saw an announcement around a three-stage plan in terms of easing of restrictions and as of Monday we've commenced stage one. What does the three-stage plan mean for SAPOL and how do you feel about the outlook in terms of being able to, uh, you know, implement and execute that? three-stage easy restrictions? The South Australian government have uh, created a transition committee that is looking at how we go from quite harsh restrictions back to as much as we can possibly achieve uh, normal community behaviour. Um, the three-stage plan is a part of that. And once again, this national plan, uh, we've seen other jurisdictions releasing or relaxing some of those restrictions, which still bring them up to where we've already been operating. So. Having performed so well in terms of controlling the virus, it puts us in a really strong position in South Australia to look at what we can do more quickly. The three-stage plan is a set of minimum benchmarks, but we're looking at how we can 
allow businesses to reopen, get back to some sort of normal trading activity as quickly as possible. So good performance against the virus control and um, community support and compliance gives us that opportunity. So we'll, we'll look at that on at least a weekly basis as to what re restrictions can be released. Every time we change a direction, which is where the restrictions come from, uh, there's a huge amount of work in that. Uh, we've got a, a very dedicated team who are doing that work. So we're always thinking about how we can get ahead of the game, start developing those new changes so it's as seamless as possible. So Grant, the COVID Safe app has now been released nationally. We've seen over 5.2 million downloads of the app. What does that mean in terms of being able to re you know, ease restrictions and move back to what um, you know, normality there may be for people? Um, when we look at uh, our ability to relax these restrictions, there are four key foundational uh, elements that need to be in place. Uh, we need to know that we have enough ICU beds in our health system and capacity to look after people who get gravely ill from the virus. We need to know that we've got a rapid response capability, so if we get a breakout somewhere, we're able to send in a health team and a response team to assess that clean up that location, restore it to its uh, proper business functions. Uh, we also need to know that we've got enough personal protective equipment for health workers and emergency services workers. And we also need to know that we've got an effective contact tracing capability. And this is where the COVID Safe app comes in. Contact tracing means when we get a positive test, we're able to identify everybody who has had close contact with that positive person. And when we identify them, we can then either quarantine them, give them medical assistance and stop that virus from spreading even further because of it's in, because we miss out on that, that contact. So we can't force people to download the COVID Safe app. It's not compulsory um, and we, we won't ever require people to do it. But it is a huge asset to us in terms of our health experts being able to trace every person who's come into contact with a positive person. So I'm, a, I'm an advocate. I've downloaded it and I'd encourage other people to do so as well. It means that we have a stronger foundation to deal with the disease as we relax restrictions if we see that the disease pops up again. I've downloaded it too, so there you go. Okay, I think it's time to move on to the questions that have been submitted in advance by our viewers. This is one. So policing the borders must be extremely difficult. What measures have you put in place for some of the country areas where there are less police officers? Well, we've actually deployed additional police to country locations. So the major access points into South Australia by road have 24-7 uh, police officers uh, on site checking the credentials of people coming into South Australia. We're still letting heavy vehicle transport come in because we need to keep the state running. We need those goods and services being provided but most other people coming into South Australia are spoken to by police on those major arterial routes. So we've got um, dozens of extra police being deployed from the metropolitan area out to country locations so we can provide that service. And SAPOL has shown really high levels of flexible work after the EOC review. What was the SAPOL experience during COVID-19 and do you think this will continue? Normally when we talk about flexible work, we're talking about employees accessing more freedom in terms of how they undertake their, their work obligations. One dimension that we've seen with this flexible working arrangement, which I'm, I'm very proud of in terms of the organisation's performance, is cancelling leave and requiring people to work additional duties, different duties, work in remote locations. There's been ab absolute... Um, willingness to support that endeavour. So it, it's almost like turning flexible working on its head. Our employees are working more flexibly for us so we can deliver the services the community need. As I mentioned before, um, this has given us an opportunity to really push the boundaries in terms of working from home. And that's so far been quite successful. So it's, it's, a, it's an evolving beast, but one that seems to be going pretty well. Okay. Another one I've got here is how prepared were we as a state for a pandemic? Well, the state uh, and the Department of Health um, are responsible for ensuring that we have a pandemic plan and that plan existed and was in place. Um, great foundation, but I don't think anybody foreshadowed the 
the significance of the coronavirus pandemic and the impact it was going to have on our community so broadly and the, the level of restrictions that we were going to experience. So uh, Australia has been very lucky in terms of other uh, viruses that have impacted on other communities around the world, SARS, um, N1H1. We weren't affected to the same extent, so we didn't have the benefit of experience. Um, I think we've learned a lot out of this process. The pandemic plan we had was really good for something that was relatively small and potentially easily contained. Um, coronavirus has um, reset uh, our expectations in terms of what level of planning we need. Um, they talk about this being a once in a hundred year type event, but yeah, there's, that doesn't mean we're going to get a hundred year break. It could happen again in two or three years. So we need to make sure that what we learn out of this process is built into our pandemic plan and we have the, the ability to scale up depending on the size of the crisis. So we're taking a little bit of a, a change in direction. So given we are easing restrictions and uh, I think you know, everyone's being encouraged now to uh, explore South Australia, if you were to stay somewhere in South Australia right now on holiday, where would that be? Well, before the uh, coronavirus hit, uh, my wife and I were trying to organise a weekend to visit um, friends of ours who live in Kangaroo Island. So we haven't completed that task yet. So I think at the first opportunity, I'd be looking to go to KI and spend a bit of time there. And I, I think it's really important to support those areas that were so significantly affected by the recent bushfires. It's almost like the uh, the impact of the bushfires has been forgotten because of uh, coronavirus um, and a complete shift of focus in relation to dealing with the virus situation. So it's probably worth people remembering that we've got some communities out there that are still suffering as a result of our um, 2020 bushfire event. So probably KI at this point. Wonderful. Well, Grant, I think that's... That's it and that's all we've got time for today but I really want to thank you for your thoughts and your insights. Thank you to you and the broader team at SAPOL for all that you're doing uh, you know in relation to manage the management of the COVID-19 crisis and you know especially your leadership uh, calm and diligent leadership during these times. Is there anything else that you would like to end with or any messages that you'd like to to give? Um, I've probably already mentioned this, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, as, as good a job as the public sector, health, police, other emergency services are doing in managing our response to the coronavirus, the way we performed in South Australia is a credit to the community of South Australia. And I don't think that can be overstated. Um, as I said, we're working with the community and the community are responding. We see a genuine desire to do the right thing and uh, I think that's put us in a really good spot and it will enable us to move back to what the new normal looks like much more quickly than other places. So all credit to the community of South Australia and I'm proud to be a South Australian. Me too. Thank you very much, Grant. Thank you.